Bible and ask Ben if he'll come and speak to us. And uh, the uh, the passage we're going to be looking at is, is Mark in chapter 1, and we're going to read the first eight verses. So if you're following it along in the church Bible, it's 1002, 1002, and it's Mark chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John, uh, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes a one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Can you just pray a moment? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reason that we have it. It's that we may learn things of you. We may have our hearts, our minds, our lives pointed towards you. And so as we look at the scripture now, as we spend this time thinking uh, about things of you, please, will you help our hearts and our minds be focused upon you, not be distracted by anything else that may come uh, into our thoughts, but instead, Lord, our attention will be given to you. You're so worthy of our attention, uh, Lord, even in this short time. But we need your help. We need your strength. We need your grace. So we just commit this time to you. So I'm, uh, I'm starting off a new series, extended series this morning. What I'm really excited about, and I'm really privileged, I think, to be able to, to start uh, for the next two weeks, actually. Advance warning, if you really don't enjoy today, it's, it's me again, God with the next week. Okay, book a holiday, better follow Ben's idea. Uh, but hopefully not, hopefully you will, you will genuinely uh, want to be here for kind of part two next week of looking at the Gospel of Mark. Now, if you don't know your Bibles very well, Mark is one of four accounts retelling the narrative of Jesus' life. OK, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And in the book of Mark, we've got this account, which is uh, taken some of it. It's taken from the same source material as Matthew, some from other areas as well, but gives us an account of Jesus. <laughs> life. Uh, unlike some of the other Gospels, it's very focused. It gets straight into the point about the story of Jesus and who he is and what he did. And uh, we're going to hopefully over the coming weeks, months, should I say years? I don't know. Definitely weeks and months, Ben saying single year. We will be working our way through uh, this gospel. But before we get into our eight verses this morning, I want to pick out something which I think helps us understand a lot about the gospel of Mark and sort of sets the scene for the weeks ahead. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say, not all, but a lot of what I'm going to be saying this morning is actually based on two series by a preacher called John Mark Comer. You may or may not have heard of John Mark Comer. Um, if you listen to UCB, he's quite often uh, there sharing parts of his uh, sermons, or they take extracts from his messages. Um, and he leads a church over in Portland in Oregon. Uh, some of us, myself, Sam, Phil Harflet, Matt, uh, and others, we've been listening to his podcast a lot lately, really would commend them to you. Really fantastic uh, way of presenting scripture and of helping us uh, understand what it means to, to follow Jesus. Um, I'm not going to regurgitate everything he says, but I am going to refer at different points to some of the things that he's mentioned. Um, I've listened to his podcast series called Practicing the Way. There's a book there as well, which I do plan on slowly making my way through. But if you know me, you know podcasts are far better than books. 
uh, for me. I don't have much time to read a book, but I can listen to a podcast while I'm in the car. I can take some moments to make sure that I'm getting some good Christian content. Uh, and The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry is a book, a book I definitely need to read, but haven't yet got round to. But I know some people here have. So I really would recommend his work to you. And I'm going to refer to one key concept really that he brings out in his Practicing the Way series, which I really think we can apply here to this Gospel of Mark and what we're going to do as we work through Mark. You see, Mark's Gospel, like the other three, introduce us to Jesus of Nazareth. And I think it's really important that we recognise that whilst we know Jesus to be the eternal Son of God, that Jesus was also a man in time. Jesus of Nazareth, living in first century Judea. And a lot of what we have to understand about Jesus, we can get so much more and go so much deeper when we place him in the historical context. I mean, yes, I brought history into it, you knew I would. But when we put him in his historical context, we can understand a lot more of who Jesus was, what he was saying, what he was asking of people. You see, Jesus of Nazareth, was an anti-establishment radical rabbi. Someone who came along with a message that was very, very different to what other Jews at the time were hearing in the land of Judea and Palestine. And his profession as a rabbi actually does have a lot of impact on us and what it means for us if we hear this morning say that we are a Christian, say that we follow Jesus. There are different themes you can pick out from Mark's gospel, but there's one I just want to point out now, which I think really can help us throughout this whole book. I want to pick it out from a few verses that we see. First of all, in Mark chapter one, verses 16 to 20, we read, this is going to be in a couple of weeks time. I think actually it might well be fortnight from today. Someone will share on this in more detail, but we read in these verses, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We move ahead to Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. In chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And then in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through the 38, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone in exchange give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. There's a pattern here coming through Mark's gospel. And it's not just one of repentance. It's not just one of belief, as important as those things are. It's one of following. It's one of discipleship. Now, to be a disciple is a word we often hear. And let's be honest, we only really hear the word disciple in Christian circles. We don't hear that word out in the secular world, do we, the idea of being a disciple? It's a word that's very much stayed within the confines of our churches. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to follow? Well, Disciple means literally that, follower, student, or perhaps the best word, the word that I want to refer to quite a lot, apprentice. Now, when I talk about being an apprentice, there's a little Star Wars vibe in my head about being an apprentice, but also I think of the students I work with and how they might go on to get an apprenticeship 
What does it mean to be somebody's apprentice? Well, let's unpack that, but let's unpack that as an apprentice in first century Judea and what that would mean. You see, because if you followed a rabbi, Jesus was a rabbi, and if you followed him as a disciple or as an apprentice, you apprenticed under them. This was very common in the time. There were lots of other rabbis that had disciples, that had people who would apprentice under them. In fact, first century world would have them all around the Mediterranean, not just in the Jewish circles, but in other ways of life, philosophy, religions, and so on. Now, within Judaism, within the Jewish culture, which Jesus was brought up in, you would have uh, quite a strict, full-on upbringing. You would have quite the challenge ahead of you. Now, I've got digital Bible in front of me today. It doesn't serve the purpose. Margaret, can I just borrow your physical Bible? Thank you. So, you would, in your schooling, stage one of your schooling, let's call it like your primary school experience, it would be your job to learn about and memorize the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which is about that much of the Bible. I don't know about you, I don't think I could do that stage. Memorize every single part of that. That was stage one. And if you did that, and you were doing very well, you had promise, then as a student of the book, you would go to the Beit Talmud, and at the Beit Talmud, you'd study all of the Old Testament scriptures. Remember, there was no New Testament. It's written after the time of Jesus. So you would have to then read, learn about, and memorize that much of scripture. You still with me? That's quite a challenge, right? And only if you showed the promise and the real intellect and understanding of scripture would you potentially be considered... Would you be considered to reach the very top levels of apprenticing under a rabbi. You'd have loads of interviews, you'd be interrogated lots and lots, and maybe you'd be selected. And if the rabbi selected you after all of that process, he'd go to you and he'd say, come, follow me. And you'd follow him and you would apprentice under him. Now, without taking from future sections, we just read some verses from Mark. Jesus just went out to some guys fishing by the side of a lake and said, come follow me. They didn't need to meet some incredible standard of entry requirements. He knew their hearts. Come, follow me. The opportunity, the invitation is far more universal and far more welcoming. But the cost is great, as we just read in Mark chapter 8. You want to take up your cross and follow me. What that means to give up. What that means to put first, because you're going to apprentice under the rabbi that is Jesus of Nazareth. You're going to follow him. And so we're going to work through Mark's gospel. And with the exception of maybe two passages, one of which being today, ironically, they're all about Jesus. And even when they're not about Jesus and he's not mentioned uh, physically being there, they're still about Jesus. We're going to follow Jesus of Nazareth through Mark's gospel. And as we follow him through the scriptures, our aim has got to be to apprentice under him to look to be his disciple and to follow him. Now, in first century Judea, being a rabbi, so following a rabbi, following a rabbi meant three simple things. And this is something that John Mark Comer outlines in, in his podcast, something that I think I found really helpful in thinking about how do I actually try and walk with Jesus? Three things that we should do when we look to follow Jesus, because these are three things that any apprentice would have done when they were following a rabbi. And they would have looked to, I'm trying to remember my lines now, I know something about they would have looked to be with them. They would have spent nearly 24 seven of their time with their rabbi. They had to give up everything to follow him, be with him, become like them and do what they did. Be with them, become like them, do what they did. This was about putting into practice what you saw from your master. Now, Jesus was a rabbi. He was also way more than a rabbi. We know that because we read in Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, Ben read to us, that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one, and the Son of God. And as we go through Mark, we're going to see more and more how he was exactly who the scriptures foretold he would be, how Jesus was our saviour, Emmanuel, God with us. We'll see that through the scriptures. We can see that 
But as they lived and as they followed him, at first they followed a rabbi. They followed a teacher. And over time, he revealed himself to them. And they opened their eyes to the fact that actually you are the Messiah. You are the one who God has promised. But it started with a rabbi, someone who they chose when they were invited to, to follow. So I hope that we're going to do more than just recall the text. I hope that as we go through this series in Mark, we're going to every single week go, right, I want to be an apprentice of Jesus. I want to be a disciple. I want to follow him. So what do I get as I work through Mark that helps me to follow him? You see, but this isn't a label. Look at me, I'm an apprentice. The word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. The word disciple is used 260 plus. So we're not a Christian. We're a follower of Jesus. That is a better description of what we would endeavour to be if we're confessing Jesus as our saviour. And that means when we follow him, to be with him, to become like him, and to do what he did. There's a Christian writer uh, and philosopher called Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard has written many different books all about the idea of spiritual transformation. And he'll be kind of the next level on my list, I think, because they are quite in depth, but there are some really interesting ideas he puts forward. And one of the things he talks about is that there's a real problem in the church with passivity, that Christians are too passive. They don't really look to push into the things of God and move forward. And I have to read it and I have to look at myself and go, yes, absolutely, that's that's true of me. But being passive in my faith too often is a problem. He sums it up with this phrase that grace is not opposed to effort, but to earning. We don't earn our salvation, but there should be an action in response to the grace given to us by Jesus. And that action is we want to follow this God. We want to live the way he told us to live. We want to look to serve him. And it's this idea of saying, that if I'm going to learn about Jesus, I'm going to learn about what he says will help me, what will bless me, what will benefit me. He says the greatest issue facing the world today is whether those who identify as Christians will become disciples whether we're willing to go on that journey with God and allow God to work and move in our hearts. And as I said, I found that incredibly challenging in the last weeks and months. I keep coming back to that idea of, is God just my little guy in the sky who I ask for help? Any moment I feel I can't do something in my own strength? Is he the one that I'll worship and say, thank you for saving me? Or is he my Lord who I'm going to follow? Is he the person I'm going to apprentice under and allow him to work in my life? That takes faith. It takes practice. It takes intentional practice to do. If you're still kind of not sure, not kind of where I'm coming from, maybe look at the misperspective. We've got in Matthew, different gospel, different account of Jesus' life. Matthew chapter five, we've got this uh, incredible series of instruction by Jesus that we call the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus outlines a tremendous amount of teaching that realistically says, this is how you follow me. This is what you should put into practice. And in Matthew 5, 19, towards the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices them, not just whoever teaches them, whoever talks about them, who practices them. Towards the end in Matthew 7, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. And many of you know the rest of this, these verses. The common uh, analogy that he put forward, that we know well, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. What's the difference? Putting it into practice. That's the only difference there that's identified in Matthew 7. Taking the example Jesus gives us as our rabbi, as our teacher, as our Lord, and looking to put it into practice. I don't even know what percentage you feel you are at. Just read through Matthew chapters five to seven and try and work out exactly where you are on the journey of fulfilling every instruction in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Can you tick them all off and say you absolutely follow that idea, that concept and that instruction all the time? I can't. I definitely can't. There's room for me to grow. There's room for me to apprentice under Jesus and put this into practice. Now, I'm not saying all of a sudden that you need to work for your salvation. This isn't about, oh, I have to, I just have to keep trying and then maybe God will accept me. That's what other religions may talk about, about trying to earn your, your place in heaven. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus and his salvation offered freely through grace to all of us. This isn't about trying, but it is about training. Sam and I have mentioned this a couple of times over the last or few weeks when we've been stood up here uh, leading the plasma service. But it's about training. We talk about the idea of like someone who goes to like a dojo and they're training in their martial arts or their different skill. Another analogy is this. If I chose today to go run, I was going to say a marathon, even 5K would be an effort for me, I reckon. But let's go with a marathon. If I chose to go and run a marathon today, 26 miles, point two, um, it doesn't matter how hard I try, am I going to run that marathon? No. No chance. I'll be lucky to make two, maybe three miles, I reckon, with no training in these shoes and this outfit. doesn't matter how hard I try, I would not run that marathon. <laughs> how would I run that marathon? I'd have to train for it. I'd have to put in the practice. I'd have to put the effort in to train myself to be able to run that marathon. And that's what an apprenticeship to Jesus is about. It's about training with him. That's what apprentices do, isn't it? They go into training to learn the skills of the master, the person who is teaching. So if we're going to be an apprentice, or in the, in the Hebrew, it's a Talmudin to Jesus, We've got three things we need to look at. We've got to be with Jesus. We've got to become like Jesus. We've got to do what Jesus did. Be with Jesus. Like it says in John 15 about how the branches must remain in the vine. Think about how Mary just wanted to sit at Jesus' feet. She wanted to be with him, to learn from him. Dallas Willard says, but the first and most basic thing we can and must do is to keep God before our minds. To direct and redirect our minds constantly to him soon our minds return to god as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north keep directing your minds to him i remember quite a few years ago now when tony was kind of doing work on our house in the bathrooms and he'd be there in our house in the morning and just christian radio one nothing else christian radio why direct your thoughts to jesus even while you're busy going about your day doing your other stuff opportunities for your thoughts to be directed to jesus so we look to be with him. And we're going to look at different ways maybe we can do that. Even next week, we're going to look at a way we can look to be with him. Become like him. Spiritual formation is a process of increasingly being possessed and permeated by the character traits of Jesus. It's when that Sermon on the Mount information actually becomes easier to live out than the alternative the world offers. That we want to, and it's our desire to live out Jesus' teaching to become more and more like him. And then the goal of any apprentice is to carry on the work of your master. That means to do what Jesus did. That's not the work of salvation because as Ben prayed earlier, on the cross Jesus said it is finished. That there was a ministry that Jesus brought on earth to show us how to live. And John Mark Comer talks about these 10 things that you can see in the life of Jesus that he demonstrated to his followers. I'm not going to read them all to you now, but you can see them up there on the screen. An apprentice of Jesus would aim to do these things, to preach the gospel, to teach people what it is to follow Jesus, to make sure that they are praying for God to work in people's lives and for his purposes to be achieved, to be someone who's doing justice, who's bringing peace into situations rather than conflict. Ways in which we look to do what Jesus did in our world, in our life, where we apprentice under him. That's a long introduction, and now we've got the eight verses. I hope you'll stay with me. But I want us to recognise that as we go through this gospel, this book, we're not just doing another book in the Bible because it's good to do a book in the Bible. And, hey, do you know what? We might read this and we'll learn something from it. We're going to look at the life of our master, Jesus. And in doing that, we're going to have the wonder of his purpose in saving us and his work on the cross and his resurrection and the living hope that that gives us. We're going to have that brought to us. But we need to then take something we put into practice as we apprentice and as we follow Jesus. And what a place to start with John the Baptist. 
It actually leads on quite well from our Heroes of Faith series that we did, because here's a guy who, although he doesn't get mentioned in Hebrews because he's a New Testament character, is a hero of faith. Here's a guy who, if we remember back to Hebrews 10, he had enduring confidence in God and in God's message and purpose for his life. In the power of that confidence, he stepped out and did the will of God, and he ultimately received what was promised. Not there on earth, he suffered a cruel, terrible execution. But he received what was promised because what was promised was the Messiah he was pointing to, the one who was come. So here we have John the Baptist. Now, Mark starts by quoting Old Testament scripture. The very first thing he does in Mark chapter one, if you've still got it open in front of you, is he talks about Jesus being the Messiah, the son of God. And he quotes from Isaiah and from Malachi. I'm going to come back to these verses in a little bit. Saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of all this prophecy that they've been they've been longing to see, that he is the one who was coming as promised. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. But here we have in John, the messenger sent ahead to prepare the way. Uh, I like this analogy that the two people who are most familiar with the smell of fresh paint are builders and royalty. Because everywhere royalty go, there's a smell of fresh paint. Because you do everything up nicely for them. So it looks smart and looks really well presented. You prepare the way for them because, hey, royalty are coming today. That's what John's doing. He's preparing the way for the king to come. That's his, his purpose. Preparing the way for Jesus and his kingdom. And he's doing it through this idea of baptism. It's not really something we've, we've heard of, not really referred to in scripture significantly. And all of a sudden, we've got John here with this ministry of baptism for repentance. Baptism means to dip, to plunge, to soak, to immerse yourself into water. Now, where did this idea come from? Why is he going around baptizing people as part of his message saying that Jesus is coming? Well, in the first century, back at the time, they used baptism for Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism. If you were not someone who was born in the Jewish faith, but you wanted to follow it, you would go through baptism as a part of that process. So it was established. However, this was a baptism that was not just for Gentiles. John's actually doing something incredibly controversial here. He's baptizing Jewish people too. He's saying that it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from, all need to come and be baptized. Now, in a very ethnic culture in first century Judea, where your ethnicity really mattered, this was very controversial to suggest that Jews need to come and be baptized, that they would need this baptism of repentance, the exact same way that a Gentile would come on those same basis and terms. And yet we read in verse five that the entire countryside came out. So we're talking thousands of people came out and were baptized, were brought into this message and this idea that the Messiah was coming. John became so famous that it tells us he was known all over Israel. We know in scripture he ends up having death threats and he ends up being executed for the work he does. This isn't just a little small thing going on in the corner in one little town. This is having a ripple effect and an impact around an entire community. They're coming in their thousands. And it was controversial because of who John was. You see, John did not fit at all with the way of life at the time. He was completely counterculture to the Jewish leaders. They were rich, they were wealthy, they were well presented. They were also corrupt and colluding with the empire of the Romans at the time. And here comes John in his camel hair, his belt, his honey and locusts, completely the opposite, saying everybody needs to come and repent. Everybody needs to come and be baptized because he's coming. I find that quite encouraging as we begin to apprentice under Jesus, as we begin to try and follow him. It's not about trying to fit and look a certain way and be a certain way. It doesn't matter. John was the complete opposite to what people expected, the complete opposite. But he had the faith to just do his bit for God, to make sure that he was living out the purpose of God in his life. He could point people to Jesus. Step one, point people to Jesus. It's all he had to do. It's all we have to do. It's a real encouragement. Now, 
if you read in Mark, Mark mentions the verses from Isaiah and Malachi. One is coming to prepare the way and so on. And there are parallels, clear parallels between John the Baptist and Elijah. And again, whilst this is getting into scripture in a bit more of an in-depth way, we're trying to understand Jesus in first century Judea. And therefore, we have to understand what was the purpose of John and why did people react in the way they did to John the Baptist? Why did they come in their thousands to see him, hear him and be baptized by him? And I don't think we've quite explained the why yet. Well, I think this is it. You see, there were parallels to Elijah. Uh, I do love this. This bit I pointed to when I was preparing. Uh, this is in 2 Kings chapter 1. And uh, the king asked these people, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? They'd, he'd given a prophecy. And they replied, oh, he had a garment of hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, oh, that was Elijah the Tishman. That was enough for him to go, yeah, that was Elijah. Yeah, absolutely, that had to be him. Elijah was well known as this incredible prophet. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, he was taken into heaven after he passed the ministry on to Elisha. And we read in Malachi, just a couple of chapters after Malachi, the section we just had uh, in Mark chapter 1. That's all preparing the way. We read in Malachi chapter 4, See, I'll send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He'll turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. You see, the people of Israel in first century Judea had been expecting Elijah to come. They were waiting for him. They've been waiting over 400 years. This is the prophecy that was to be. And then John appears in his camel hair with his leather belt, preaching that the kingdom has come. The people in Judea in the first century, they would have understood that reference. They would have seen, maybe this is Elijah. Maybe this is the time. Maybe God is, is coming and is going to move. The Messiah is going to come and is going to free us. And John talks about this idea that one more powerful than I is coming. Now, I'm told uh, from the research I looked into here that one more powerful than I was actually first century language for Yahweh, for God. So it wasn't just there's another person coming, another speaker who's going to appear here. One more powerful than I was saying, God is coming. Yahweh, in his promise, is coming to meet us. And he said, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie his sandals, which is a filthy, horrible job, and I'm not worthy to do it. Because he's one way more powerful than I. Yahweh is coming. And Isaiah and Malachi, they're preparing the way for Yahweh's return. Here in Mark, John is preparing the way for Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, the anointed one, is coming. He's pointing to the promises being fulfilled. Now, what did they hope for in the Messiah coming? People in first century Judea believed that when the Messiah came, that they were going to experience freedom. They'd lived under occupation for a very long time from lots of different groups. Persians, Babylonians, and now under the Romans. And one of their biggest mistakes is that's what they believe Jesus was coming to do. Jesus was coming to free them from the Roman occupation. That he was coming to bring a sword. That he was coming to make the kingdom of Israel again. They didn't understand really what Jesus was coming to do. What the much, much bigger task in hand was. And it's really important that we understand actually what it was that Jesus was going to do. You see, when we talk about what Jesus has done for us, when we talk about salvation, we talk about the gospel, we often use legal terms to describe it. We talk about the fact that Jesus was our substitute. Jesus was the ransom payment. Jesus has uh, justified. The debt has been paid. We are redeemed. We talk about salvation like a transaction. And <coughs> that is right. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He who was no sin became sin for us. The reason we use that language a lot is actually another little bit of history for you. It's to do with the Reformation. It's to do with the fact that a lot of the uh, people who led the Reformation away from the Roman Catholic Church were also lawyers as well as theologians. So they used legal language as they unpacked the idea 
of what salvation meant from scripture. And that's one way we can see Jesus' work for us. But we also can see that it's a little bit more than that. You see, John was coming to bring freedom. Jesus was coming to bring freedom, not physical freedom from the occupation of the Romans, but redemption from slavery. Like the Passover lamb, Jesus was the sacrifice that would bring about a new exodus. This is what John was referring to. You see, if you think about the people of Israel in Exodus, in that uh, second book of the Bible, the Passover lamb, the blood is put across the doors and the angel comes over. There's the death of the firstborn and the Israelites are free. Right, end of the story? No, beginning of the story, really, of God's work with his people. He takes them out of Egypt. He takes them through the Red Sea, across the wilderness, into the promised land, establishes a nation. The Exodus is way more than just we took you out of Egypt. It's everything they were being taken into. God sent Jesus to forgive our sins. God sent Jesus to reconcile and bring us back to him. So that we might live life in its fullness. So that we might know what it is to follow Jesus. To apprentice and live under him the way he wanted us to. What we're saying here, Mark is saying that we want to be led on a new exodus. A journey out of ourselves, the damage we might have experienced, the troubles we've had. Through incredible obstacles that we will see his promises in our lives. This is what John is saying Jesus is bringing. Not freedom from a ruler or oppression, but freedom from our sin and an exodus away from that into a new journey with God, where we live his way, we follow his purposes. And there's one more bit to look at here as we draw to a close that shows us this. If you look back at Mark chapter 1 and the last few verses here, when John has said, I can't even untie his sandals, in the last verse, verse 8, John said, I baptise you with water, but he'll baptise you with the Holy Spirit. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. And we know the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us. If salvation is just a transaction, all I need is a receipt, proof of purchase, right? Job done. If salvation is about transformation... It's about something changing me, but I need way more than just that proof of purchase. I need a continual work in my life. In first century Judea, what did this idea mean? Being baptised by the Spirit. You look in the Old Testament, and whenever it mentions the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was on a select few. Key people who were blessed with the Spirit of God. And actually, they were one of three things. They were a prophet, they were a priest, or they were a king. Prophet, a priest, or a king. They were a select few who might have been anointed with oil, who were symbolically stated, God's presence rests on me. But even in the Old Testament, the prophets pointed to a new covenant where God would pour out his spirit on all people, not on a select few. Isaiah chapter 44, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Ezekiel chapter 36, I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols, a transaction of salvation. And then I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from uh, your heart of stone, you from your heart of stone, and give your heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you, and move you to follow my decrees, and be careful to keep my laws. Put the spirit in you, so that actually the transformation occurs, so that you can follow an apprentice under Jesus. Joel chapter 2, afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. This is the impact of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus, he was prophet, 
priest, and king. He was all of those things, this perfect sacrifice, and this perfect one who could also bring this sacrifice to satisfy, start satisfy God's judgment. And from that, this blessing can pour out to all, not just to a select few. And we read through the uh, epistles. In Corinthians, we're told we're prophets. In 1 Peter, we're told we're priests. In Revelation, we're told we're to be rulers. We get to experience the same blessings of the prophet, the priest, and the king. Because this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit with us, working in our lives, immersed in Jesus' spirit, it means we get to experience God with us, each and every one. So what does this mean, then, to finish? Depends on where you are. In your own journey with God. This morning, do you need to listen to John's call? Do you need to repent? Do you need that transaction of salvation in your life to bring you under the leadership and authority of the rabbi, the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe the next stage for you is baptism. To actually say, I am going to be baptised. I am going to say that now I choose to follow Jesus. I choose to apprentice under him. To be filled with his Holy Spirit and led by his direction, his guidance. And if you can sit here this morning and you've stayed with me, well done. And you can go, no, I've done those things. I know that I've accepted Jesus as my saviour. I've been baptised and I know that his Holy Spirit is with me. Then are you ready to go on a journey of apprenticeship in the coming weeks and months? Are you ready to actually follow the master that is Jesus? To look at what we learn from him, maybe come out of our own cruise control where we've been settling for too long and push into being with him, becoming like him. And doing more and more of what he did. We've got a big journey ahead. Even next week, we've got highs and lows. I'm going to read ahead, verses 9 to 13. You'll see straight away we get into Jesus' ministry. And when an apprentice starts, their skills are pretty limited. They get given the pretty basic jobs to do until they can learn their skills and learn their trade. But they're going on a journey of apprenticeship with their master to know what it is to to be able to fulfill that role themselves. And we're being invited to go on a journey, a new exodus, taken out away from our old lives and walking with Jesus, allowing him to transform us as we follow him. Let's pray. Lord, we Father God, we, we thank you so much, Lord. Your, your son came to redeem and to save, to remove the barrier of sin so that we could, could know you and we could be brought back to where we should be in relationship with you. And we want to be in relationship with you, but we want to acknowledge, Lord, in that relationship that you, you are the Lord. You are the teacher. You are our rabbi. And maybe for some of us, that's for the first time, Lord, but for many of us who I, who I think I know here this morning, it may be more about a, a recommitment to follow you. To really look to practice the ways of Jesus. And Father, as we always ask, we want to just look to you. And so in the coming days and weeks, we pray, Lord, in our situations that you would help us, first of all, just to, to be with you. To look to you. But Father, this week, you would really uh, put on our, our hearts and minds. <laughs> This wriggling, niggling thought that we can't shake says, actually, it, it's time to, to really follow Jesus. 
to, to push on in our apprenticeship of transformation, to allow you to lead us. We thank you that we have got your perfect example of your life and your ministry here on earth. And we pray we would give room for the Holy Spirit to work that into our lives, we ask. Pray we'd encourage one another. We'd be a church family together, pushing on into the things of you. We thank you, Father, for your strength and for your mercy in all these things. Amen.